We are rocking. Yeah. It is very exciting to be a part of the University of South Florida system. The goal of these videos is to make an emotional connection with the audience. I just find it ironic that in 2016, when we're going to a tobacco-free campus, they want to bring guns on campus for the first time. Hello, I'm Denise White, and this is University Beat, where we pose the question, what's going on at the University of South Florida? And there's no better place to find that out than from our first guest, the president of University of South Florida System, Dr. Judy Genshaft. And President Genshaft, welcome to University Thank Beat. You. We're so glad Pleasure to have to you here. here. And you know, all three campuses are celebrating, or about to celebrate an anniversary right now. 60 years for Tampa, yes. right? 50 for St. Petersburg, and 40 for Sarasota Manatee. And so from that perspective, how would you assess the overall state of the university system? We are rocking. Yeah. It is very exciting to be a part of the University of South Florida system. We graduate about um, almost 13,000 students every year from the USF system. And um, each of our institutions are serving their own communities as well as serving the whole region. And so um, USF makes a difference. No matter where you've graduated, USF is a part of your university and your economic development in the Tampa Bay region. You know, there's just been so many accomplishments since you've been here the past 16 years. Uh, USF recently was named a top 25 public university for research funding. Uh, there have been other accolades for medicine, engineering, business and overall value. How does that kind of national recognition help the university? It is huge. It's huge because when you're that proficient in writing grants, then other researchers get to know you. They want to work with our researchers and the grant getting is even better. So we bring in about $440 million every year to this Tampa Bay region in outside grants and contracts. Being the top 25 in the country of public universities is awesome. That is impressive. And we're only number two, number two in the state of Florida. The Morsani School of Medicine is going to become part of downtown Tampa. Why is that so important? Well, it's very important. The top uh, medical schools are co-located or very closely located to their major teaching hospital. Only five of the top 100 medical schools are not located next to their teaching hospital. We are one of the five. So for us to go and be next to the major teaching hospital is going to be very, very exciting. We also have teaching sites at other places like the Haley VA, and the Bill Young VA, as well as uh, All Children's Hospital and Shriners, but the major teaching hospital is Tampa General Hospital, so being very close to them mm -hmm. is very exciting, as well as in that building will be the Heart Institute, and that is key also, because this is a research center that will bring new discoveries and best practices for heart issues, and that will cardiovascular no, issues. And that might bring in, probably no doubt, would bring in more funding, more grants, right? More funding, more grants. It could bring in um, pharmaceutical companies that want to work with uh, in clinical trials um, because you know that heart issues are the number one killer in America. What about on-campus uh, on, and on-campus football stadium? Is that going to happen? <laughs> Everybody is asking me that question. We are going to do a feasibility study and we'll see what that brings out. What kind of changes do you see in the future, short term and long term? The whole idea of a major university is to get better and better. And in the top 25 of public research universities, now we need to move that up uh, as well. So we're taking 
we're, we're trying to make the environment one that enhances learning. And we have a $135 million project that will be occurring on the Tampa campus that has um, about uh, new residence halls. We'll take down some of our more mature residence halls mm -hmm. that you can't paint anymore right. to make them better. Yes. We'll take some down, we'll add new ones. About 2,000 additional residence halls will be there with shops and um, restaurants, um, a complete recreational center, swimming pool. That will bring a lot more people on the, onto the campus, as well as raising and bringing in more top-level faculty. And top-level faculty bring in students. Students want to come to study with Professor this or Professor that. Um, so it's, it's raising the bar at all levels. We need to be so connected to uh, the economic development as well as not just providing a workforce, that's certainly part of it, but also working directly with um, uh, industry and bankers and our whole Tampa Bay economy. We do this through USF Sarasota Manatee and USF St. Petersburg as well as USF Tampa. We want every student to have an internship, whether you're in philosophy, history, accounting, or engineering, nursing, whatever. We want to see every student have an internship. That will bring out some real life experience along with our textbook experience. The other item that I wish will happen, um, every student, whether you're undergrad or grad, will have at least one international experience. As a matter of fact, when students are accepted and they receive at to USF and they receive their uh, portfolio, of acceptance in there is a passport application because we have funds to help people travel internationally. They may even do their internship internationally. Dr. Genshev, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you. Concealed weapons on Florida's college campuses carried legally by students, faculty, anyone who is licensed to do so. A bill to allow just that was passed this legislative session by the Florida House of Representatives, although it's been effectively killed by the state Senate for now. There is no consensus on the idea, either in Tallahassee or here on the USF campus. Mark Schreiner reports. Protecting thousands of students, faculty, and staff at the 12 schools in the state university system is a difficult job. Many of the people who work in law enforcement at those schools including the men and women of the University of South Florida Police Departments, believe that difficulty would be compounded by allowing concealed weapons on their campuses. We've had the um, police chiefs from around the uh, SUS. They've testified on this matter. The Board of Governors has uh, uh, given an opinion on the matter. And right now, we just really need to wait for this legislation. and We need to see exactly um, what's going to happen. While lawmakers discussed this, the people most directly affected, the students, recently debated the issue as well. Shana Lopez Rivas, and she was um, a student at FSU, and she was a victim of rape. And she has stated that she resolves to never be a victim again, and she will not be a sitting duck for a rapist or a shooter. About 100 students and faculty braved blustery January evening conditions at the Outdoor Marshall Student Center Amphitheater for Debatable. Two students on each side, one group pro-concealed carry, one against, were chosen by USF student government after submitting position papers. It ends up being, you know, an active shooter comes into your classroom and two or three people stand up and you just have to trust that they're not going to accidentally hit you. The students tried to sway the audience not only with facts but emotional arguments as well. I have my girlfriend here today, we have two kids. Which one of you in the audience wants to go to my family and tell them, well, sorry, you know, your son, your boyfriend, whoever, he died today because I didn't allow him to protect himself. I just find it ironic, or more idiotic, actually, that in 2016, when we're going to a tobacco-free campus, 
Do we want to bring guns back on campus? Or bring guns on campus for the first time? If I have an option between the two, I say bring back the smokers. They also took up the argument over the safety of gun-free zones. When a person is set to wreak havoc, what they do is they go to a place they're familiar with. They, they don't necessarily think, hey, I'm going to go here because no one has a gun. Because they know they have the advantage anyway, if people have guns or not, because they have a surprise. They have the advantage of the surprise, and that's the biggest advantage. Do you feel safe on the USF campus without concealed carry? Yes, I do. But it's also because I'm a six-foot male at close to 300 pounds, so there's not too many people that feel they're going to go ahead and win over on me. Small female, five foot one, maybe 100 pounds, may not have the same presence of mind. After the debate, students on all sides of the issue weighed in as well. Um, I would never carry a gun on a college campus because, first of all, I am not in favor of guns in general, other than obviously for people who are more than qualified to carry them, such as police officers, military personnel. Um, I think that the statistics are pretty clear. If there are guns, they're more likely to be used. It's pretty obvious. I'm very conflicted on the issue myself because personally I'm kind of against guns, so I kind of want to hear a person who had a coherent thought on the other side. But I would definitely take advantage of that bill and I would definitely feel a lot safer on campus knowing that permitted individuals are doing so. The topic is not going away. Concealed carry proponents indicate they'll continue pushing for the legislature to approve the bills. For University Beat, I'm Mark Schreiner. On this week in USF history, the school got its fourth president. Francis Borkowski began his term on February 14, 1988. Borkowski replaced John Lott Brown and stayed five years, leaving USF in 1993 for Appalachian State University. Ten years ago, a USF student named Maxon Victor wanted to celebrate the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, but in a way that would incorporate Dr. King's legacy of service. That idea became the tradition known as the Stampede of Service, a day of volunteering. This year, about 2,000 students turned out, along with administrators, faculty, and staff. And they worked with dozens of organizations throughout the area on a variety of projects, cleanup, repair, taking donations, and helping to cook meals. Stampede of Service is hosted by the USF Center for Leadership and Civic Engagement. Students aren't the only ones giving back to their community. The USF Alumni Association also performs volunteer work. We recently found a group of USF alums at a Habitat for Humanity project in Pinellas County. We memory. asked some of them about their fondest University memory of the university. My favorite memory going to USF would probably have to be football games and rushing the West Virginia, rushing the field for the West Virginia football game. I really enjoyed my time uh, writing. I wrote for the Oracle um, during my first couple of years. I was a mass communications major, and that was a lot of fun. Actually, I got to cover the Tampa Bay Bucks kind of in their inf infancy years. What I really liked about the St. Pete campus was the ability to go study in the library and look over the water, the closeness of the community and the faculty of, at USF St. Pete. From a peek at the past to a look to the future, this fall USF Sarasota Manatee will begin enrolling students in its new STEM college. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering and Math. The change will result in more classes aimed at meeting the technology demands of the workforce. The new College of Science and Mathematics has been more than a year in the planning. So a student who joins us will, ha will have the benefit of the small student to faculty ratio that we have of 13 to 1. They, the student would work alongside world-class professors and world-class researchers, for example, in our biology program at the Moat Marine Laboratories. This is all done in an environment that many times people describe as being a private school education at a public school price. Eventually, the Sarasota campus is scheduled for new buildings and dormitories, more undergraduate research, and new partnerships with local businesses. Also in place is a program that allows students to earn credits on six different area campuses and count them towards a single degree. We've, we've looked at some opportunities that we might make available for students to take courses at each other's institutions if there are particular things that one of us offers that the other doesn't. The Chancellor says the campus has an ambitious five-year transformation plan and that it's on track to meet its goals. 
We've talked a bit on today's show about how USF has climbed toward the top of lists ranking universities in a variety of categories. And here's another one. The school's women's basketball team over the past five seasons has built itself into a national power. This year's team, led by senior guard Courtney Williams and freshman forward Kit Yulasko, has been as high as number 15 in both the Associated Press rankings and the U.S. Today coaches poll. That is the highest the team has ever gotten. Last year, the Bulls finished with 27 victories, tied for the most in school history, and made it to the NCAA tournament for the second time in three seasons. Coach Jose Fernandez is in his 14th season and is the winningest basketball coach in USF history. For more than a century, Tampa has cheerfully surrendered to the yearly pirate invasion known as Gasparilla, when a flotilla of would-be swashbucklers takes over the city. At USF, pirates will be taking over the stage when the theater department presents the classic Gilbert and Sullivan comic operetta called The Pirates of Penzance. The production, with minimal sets, choreography, and props, tells the story of Frederick, the pirate apprentice, and his struggle to free himself from the marauders and find true love. Dr. Robin Rockline is the show's director. The fun part is we have pirates and we have generals and we have dancing and we have swords and we have um, all sorts of merriment and the students are super thrilled about doing such a great work. You know, it's, it's just like musical theater. It's a story with music and some dialogue. It's so much fun. Um, the students are having a great time and you'll get to see pirates. It's just like Gasparilla but on the stage. Tickets are available at the College of the Arts box office with performances at 7.30 on the nights of February 26th and 27th. To reserve your ticket, call 813-974-2323. Dance is something we usually associate with entertainment. We watch dancers, we might even dance ourselves, especially if we think no one is watching. But dance as an agent of social change, as a way of possibly saving lives, well, that's what members of the USF School of Dance are trying to do. Hedel Gandhi has their story. Victims of human trafficking live in the shadows. You get tighter, get tighter, get tighter, and smothering, smothering, smothering. Good, good, good. And Madison kind of goes These dance the moves painting a vivid picture of the reality they face every day. What we're trying to portray is the scenario of what's called a Romeo pimp. Someone who specifically sets out to have their victims fall in love with them, that they'll do anything. And Antonio, what I'm really looking for right now is uh, this controlling kind of movement. USF assistant professor Andrew Carroll choreographs these dance videos to promote social change. Um, exactly. Keep taking, keep taking. The feeling of being trapped and struggling and bound to this, even though you know something is wrong, and she's bound to you no matter what she does. Capturing that struggle means studying human trafficking closely so that Carroll and his dancers can properly portray both the victim and the pimp. He could be in your very backyard, in your neighborhood, in your, in your own local schools, uh, this idea of a man that will f uh, force a girl almost to fall in love with him and then use her and make her feel like she's the one doing all of the wrong. Madison McGrew, the senior who plays the victim, says this project opened so her eyes. Why does this cause exist? Why do people find it in their hearts to do bad? What can I do to bring more good? A am I partaking in the bad by not being a voice? These videos help create that voice. It began with this anti-bullying campaign. You could see them sitting at a computer and reaching back because they were being cyberbullied or receiving messages that were startling. Um, and then I would crossfade it to that dancer actually on stage, kind of in movement, what that might feel like. The goal of these videos, to make an emotional connection with the audience, not just those sitting here in the theater, but people throughout the nation and across the globe. Because there's no actual language, People in Finland were using it just as much as people in Australia, in Germany, in 
America, and I thought, wow, this is a great medium. A video so powerful, it was adopted by the World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease Control as part of their anti-bullying campaigns. Carol said it had an impact on both victims and bullies. He said, if I had seen your video in school, I would have stopped bullying. And I thought, okay, you know, this video can work. And if it can just stop one person, then we've done good. That inspired Carol to create other projects like this date rape awareness video and this one about suicide prevention. All share one common lesson. If you see it happening, help. Talk to somebody, stand up for them, stand up for what's right, which became a slogan for the uh, title of the video. Videos that speak volumes without ever saying a word. For University Beat, I'm Hedel Gandhi. Our final story on this first edition of University Beat is a goodbye to a colleague. Next month, Bob Seymour is leaving WUSF Radio as a full-time announcer. He'll still do some volunteer work on air, but no longer will be the voice of all night jazz, something he's been for a long, long time. We asked Bob why he came to USF, why he stayed for more than three decades, and why jazz. With jazz through the night, every night, we'll have NPR news updates every hour. I'm Bob Seymour. Growing up in the 50s, early 60s, I was one of those kids with uh, my transistor radio always to my ear or up late at night, logging all the stations I could get to the degree that I heard jazz coming from radio from Chicago. It always spoke to me. I wanted, it, I was the kind of kid who read the fine print on the back of an album and uh, pursued my interest, followed my heart, and uh, the music, the in the nowness, the spontaneity of it, and the from the heartness of jazz really just always uh, made me want to hear more. This is Jaco Pastorius, Three Views of the Secret on All Night Jazz. It's not in the mainstream of American culture in a way, but there's so much great music, of course, in the history of jazz. Great music being made right now. Once it's uh, in your system, uh, it is something that you want to know more and more about. I began doing radio after college, moved to uh, Florida, but after a couple of stations in the Bay Area and Sarasota, a job came open, a friend told me about it, uh, at WUSF, jazz slash news slash production. And at that point, I was working at an all-news station, had a strong interest in a lot of music, but especially jazz, and it just seemed uh, tailor-made. I got real lucky. I never imagined uh, 35 years in one place, and uh, 35 years, of course, in a job in radio is uh, a pretty strange thing. But I, again, I've uh, been very lucky, and uh, it has really, it's a little hard to believe. It's uh, really flown by. I've stayed at WUSF because it fits the bill in so many ways. I can be involved with music that I really love. The weather's good, the arts community is vibrant, and it's been a terrific place to be for what's turned into 35 years. The listeners are the vital link in the chain, and I've made lifelong friendships with uh, people who listen to the station. It's always a, a real kick to meet someone who know that you've made a difference in their lives, and the artists and the people in the music world who uh, you really have a closer relationship with the listener than you do sometimes with those you work with because you tend to work individually doing a radio program, uh, especially at night. I uh, don't even think of it as a, a mass medium. I'm always talking to one single person, not a particular person, but always addressing the individual listener. It's nice when somebody uh, uh, lets you know that they're listening and they're sharing that moment with you. But to me, that's always been important, is just the radio as a medium that uh, you're addressing that one person. This is All Night Jazz on WUSF 89.7. More coming up, NPR News is next. It's been a great ride. I want to say thanks. Thank you, Bob. If there's a story about the University of South Florida you'd like to see us cover, let us know. 
Our email address is ubeat at wusf.org. Our website is universitybeattv.org. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by searching University Beat TV. Thank you for joining us on University Beat. I'm Denise White.